for the next section, uh, what I'm going to do is these two sections, defining encryptogenic stroke, patient selection for PFO closure, are pretty closely related. They're, uh, but they're not entirely. And I do want to take a moment to, to s s make the important distinction here that many times when discussing stroke etiology with a patient, the diagnosis of the etiology is, is, is as important as the treatment that we will find sometimes patients in whom we make a diagnosis that it's not necessarily cut and paste that they always get um, the next step of treatment. But hearing what the cause is, hearing what their risk is, understanding the natural history of that disease, that's really the, the, the role of the neurologist is to make the, the proper diagnosis and to, to include as much as possible the patients in that and then to turn separately to the conversation of management. Uh, management uh, comes after uh, diagnosis. So uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about here is uh, that the, the previous talk, we talked a little bit about how there was a, a historical shift in uh, the data over time away from negative trials and toward positive trials. And, and it did occur, as, as I hope I illustrated, through better trial design. Uh, but what that really reflected was appropriately selected patients, getting the right patient to the right therapy. And the, these studies had variations in inclusion criteria. We, we, I mentioned briefly some of their, how they allow different shunt sizes. Uh, but in general, the result was a more accurate diagnosis of cryptogenic stroke. So we're going to talk about diagnosis and patient selection. This is an uh, outline of, of a stroke workup. If a patient comes into the hospital and has a stroke, uh, how do we proceed? What are our, our steps? So um, there are tissue-based diagnosis, especially in this population, vessel evaluation, and then looking for embolic source. This is somewhat chronological as well. You start by determining whether or not you're dealing with ischemia and then looking uh, at the, the proximate causes. As far as nomenclature, the, the term cryptogenic stroke is one that uh, I have a little bit of a problem with. Cryptogenic stroke means a stroke of undetermined etiology. We don't know hidden cause. And uh, as this data has evolved, as we've just gone through, we now know that PFO is a cause. And so causing, calling it a cryptogenic stroke seems a little bit, um, you know, 10 years ago. So I think that uh, the new term uh, that, that has been adopted in, in more and more in the literature is, is embolic stroke of undetermined source. So ESIS has taken over more and more uh, for uh, uh, the nomenclature. But even ESIS, I think, has its problem because it remains with undetermined source. Again, if you can certainly find the source, it's no longer an ESIS. So uh, that's, uh, I think, a challenge. I, I, I think uh, I, I tend to go with just the word embolic stroke and, and leave it at that. And we will uh, see what, uh, what comes of the evaluation to determine the source. So this is the, the tissue-based diagnosis as a stepwise approach is MRI imaging. And this specifically applies to this patient population. MRI is essential. Uh, I, I understand that, that MRI is sometimes a hassle for patients who are claustrophobic. I understand that there are contraindications to MRI. But if you think of the contraindications such as pacemaker, uh, in, in some cases, wouldn't really apply so much to this patient population, that I, I'd be hard-pressed to think of a patient who I considered uh, cryptogenic who had a pacemaker. Um, so really, the, the MRI is, uh, is the gold standard and the necessary uh, criteria for starting uh, the diagnosis of ischemic stroke. If the MRI is not positive, then it certainly could be a TIA. It could be a ischemic a stroke that is a, you know, a non-MRI stroke. Those occur. We know they occur. Uh, but in that case, there's just not enough support for the diagnosis of ischemia to proceed with uh, a device uh, treatment. So in those cases, the uh, MRI negative, the patient should be medically managed. If the MRI is positive, then we have tissue information. We know what the, the patient's brain looks like, not just as terms of an acute stroke, but we know what their brain has looked like over decades. We know whether or not they have chronic small vessel disease. And if that's the case, we should treat them with medical management. 
However, chronic small vessel disease or small vessel disease and small stroke don't necessarily go hand in hand. You can certainly have an embolic stroke that causes a small infarct, and all small vessel disease causes small infarcts, but they are not uh, equivalent. So this is what I mean by that. So this is a patient who comes in with a DWI positive MRI, and we see a small stroke. Uh, the tissue description is sometimes a cooner, but this is just a small ischemic stroke. Uh, Calling something lacunar sometimes makes people think immediately that it's small vessel disease, and, and, and I, I'd recommend we stay away from that term. So it's a small stroke. If we look at that as two different patients, flare imaging. So flare imaging is what gives us a sense of their chronic disease of their brain. What are we dealing with? So patient A, this is the flare image from patient A, and I don't know if it's projecting well, but I'll tell you that it's clean. It's pristine. There's no other ischemia there, no prior chronic infarcts. But in patient B, I've shown four spots, but there's really a confluent small vessel white matter change. So in, in patient A, we have an isolated small acute infarct, and in patient B, we have many small vessel disease in which this is the most recent. So those are two different conditions. So if we're looking at that patient A, the one who has only uh, one acute infarct, uh, then we move on to vessel imaging, and we look at either an MRA, a CTA, a Doppler, and look for atherosclerosis or other vessel disease. So if there's a vessel stenosis or significant atherosclerosis, well, that's the etiology, or at least uh, highly suggestive that that's the etiology, and one should proceed to medical management for atherosclerosis. Other diseases that might show up in the vessel wall, uh, dissection, uh, reversible seroblastoconstriction syndrome, moya moya. It won't show up in vessel disease, but microangiopathic disease or and uh, TTP and vasculitis. So just we we know that in middle aged and older patients, stroke is generally a relatively homogeneous disease. It's a disease of atherosclerosis. But if we look at the younger age population, it's a very heterogeneous disease, many different causes. And these other causes, which are listed up here, are just a few examples of, of, of ones that can affect uh, younger age patients. And unlike PFO emboli, these are typically multiple regions of ischemia, or certainly can be multiple regions of ischemia. So these are just some examples. Patient who has a vertebral artery dissection it's involving the, the pica territory, but two different regions of the pica territory. A patient with moya moya will have often watershed ischemia in different territories. A patient with TTP or microangiopathic will have scattered ischemia in multiple regions. And those multiple regions of emboli are actually uncommon with PFO-related stroke. We, we looked at that in the REDUCE trial, and, and what was the, how many patients who had a PFO embolism had multiple areas of stroke on their brain? Well, the answer was only 10%. So the vast majority, 90% of the patients who come in with an embolic stroke do not have multiple cerebral territories involved. They're, this is a PFO-related emboli, uh, much like AFib-related emboli, are typically a macro emboli. So these large, occlusive, uh, one vessel uh, getting the, the brunt of the damage. Versus these other diseases are either are hemodynamic or affect uh, the microcirculation through microemboli and uh, end up having more vascular tissue involvement. I would say that's probably the most important point to, to, to take home from uh, looking at patients, that if one is thinking of emboli as being a disease of multiple territories, um, it's, it's not what the data shows. So when we go looking for uh, em embolic source, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. As, as much as I, I'd like to have a straightforward algorithm here, there, there isn't. Uh, one has to consider major medical conditions that are affecting the patients. If they have DVT, uh, PE, certainly if they have cancer. Uh, in those ca cases, one certainly recognizes that the patients have a risk of venous thromboembolism. Also looking at the patient's heart directly and, and seeing if there's any abnormalities, cardiomyopathies, wall motion abnormalities, other factors that might uh, make one concerned that that could be a source of, of emboli, uh, and to certainly consider occult atrial fibrillation. Um, 
I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about this. We have a, that as a feature of further discussion. Uh, but I will say that if you're looking for one test early on to tell you that you're on the right track for, for PFO as a source, or you're not on the right track, it's, it's really the baseline EKG. In a patient who has a stone cold normal EKG that has no signs of you know, prior MI, no signs of left atrial enlargement, sinus rhythm, uh, then in those cases that goes towards uh, doing a PFO workup. Uh, but if there is abnormalities on the EKG, one should start thinking about other etiologies. So this is uh, one way that I think that we can take an evidence-based approach of how, who do you select for, for worrying that this is an occult atrial fibrillation versus uh, worrying that this is a, a PFO etiology. What do the patients look like in the two different groups? Because this is a real fork in the road, determining whether or not the embolism was from an AFib that we just have to keep waiting to detect or that we're never going to detect AFib because it's not there. And, and I think that the, the evidence-based approach I've taken for looking at this is actually to go to the table one for, our, for two studies. Our study reduced and then the um, Crystal AF study. So Crystal AF was a, uh, a device uh, that was implanted to monitor for AFib and of course reduced was the PFO study. So in the patients who are thought to be good candidates for, for the uh, crystal AF study, they looked more like they had vascular disease. They were more, uh, their average age was 62. They were, had vascular risk factors that were prominent, such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking. Uh, and, and those patients were found to have an event rate in the crystal AF study of about 10%. So they detected occult atrial fibrillation in about 10% of patients. Compared to the table one data for reduce, younger patient population, 45 years old, uh, had relatively low incidence uh, of hypertension, only 25%, low incidence of other uh, vascular risk factors. So um, just thinking again about that atherosclerotic versus non-atherosclerotic helps to, to point you in the direction of what, what, whether this is a hidden arrhythmia. But keep in mind that the population of patients who are 50 to 59, just in general, uh, the incidence of AFib in that group is 0.7%. So crystal AF detected it in patients over 60, 10%, but as, as a population, it's 0.7 in the 50 to 59, and even lower under 50. So the yields from long-term monitoring, one has to at least keep that in mind when you're, when you're looking at that patient. So if forced to do an algorithm, this, this is what, we, what, what exists. This is on the left-hand side is really what I've just uh, illustrated. Um, I think that's available soon as a handout for, um, for, for anyone who's interested. And another publication did a similar uh, approach uh, illustrating it. I think that uh, this uh, algorithm is more geared towards how one actually goes stepwise through the process. And I think that this is more helpful for if you've already kind of looked at a lot of data and you're trying to sort at the end of the day whether or not it's atherosclerotic or not. 